And thank you all of you who came, probably most of you, a long way to, to arrive here. Um, so my book, Twice Alive, is dedicated to two people here in the audience, Ashwini Bhatt and Lakshmi Bhatt. Lakshmi, where they're sitting in the front. Thank you. <clears throat> this reading wouldn't be taking place but for the enthusiasm of Satya Prakash Varanasi. I'm grateful for my friendship with him and with his expansively generous wife, Vishala. And also to Ravi, who made real this dream of this community cultural space. I also want to say hello, if she's here, to the journalist Surabha uh, Rao, to my friend, the writer and translator Chandan Gauda, who didn't actually come, and to the multi-genre artistic phenomenon, if he's here, Jeet Dayal, and to the intellectual and scholar Manu Chakravarti, and to my dear friend D.P. Rao. <clears throat> so I'll, um, I'll give you a little context for um, my trajectory as a, as a poet <clears throat> here now in this uh, second decade of the 21st century. All of us find ourselves um, better prepared to navigate through a world of different voices and dialects. But we're aware that the language practices commandeering history are increasingly standardized, utilitarian, and transcriptional. We're already experts at navigating sound bites. We absorb cliches and ready-made phrases in newspapers, on television, in gossip, and casual conversation. With text messaging, emojis, grammar, and spell check programs, we're offered in the middle of making a word or sentence a range of choices for completing it. Those choices are programmed to the most likely possibilities among conventions. The full range of possibility is shoehorned into high probability solutions. These shortcuts, of course, are useful, but they nudge us toward predetermined expressions, presumptive ruts that circumscribe thinking and condition perception. As globalization draws us together and industrialization and human population pressures take their toll on natural habitats, as we see species of plants and animals flicker and snuffed from the earth, it may be worthwhile to ask whether an ethnocentric view of human beings as a species independent of others underpins our exploitation of natural resources and sets into motion dire consequences. What we've perpetrated on our environment has affected a poet's and an artist's means and materials. But can poetry really be ecological? Can it display or be invested with values that acknowledge the economy of interrelationship between the human and non-human realms? Aside from issues of just theme and reference, how might syntax or line break, perspective stance, or the shape of the poem on the page express an ecological ethics? If our perceptual experience is mostly palimpsestic or endlessly juxtaposed and fragmented, if events rarely have discrete beginnings or endings, but only layers, duration, and transitions, if natural processes are already altered by and responsive to human observation, how does poetry register that complex interdependency that draws us into a dialogue with the world. There are, of course, long traditions of the pastoral, poetry centered on nature or landscape in both Eastern and Western language literatures. I myself am less interested in nature poetry when nature feature, features simply as a theme than in poetry, sometimes called eco-poetry, which investigates 
Both thematically and formally, the relation between nature and culture, language and perception. My dear late friend, the Kashmiri poet, Aga Shahid Ali, used to make fun of the kind of poetry in which nature is regarded merely as an object of contemplation. He knew that what defines an object is our separation from it. He used to say that nature poetry of the popular American poet Mary Oliver usually went about like this. I walk outside, I see a flower, I have an orgasm of delight, and I come inside and write about it. In this kind of poetry, nature is forever outside of us, whereas in actuality, we are never separate from nature. At this precise moment, in fact, Helminth parasites are swimming around in our intestines. Bioflora in our digestive tract are helping us break down our lunch. In the warmth behind D.P. Rao's knees and in the crooks of Ashwini Bhatt's arms, millions of bacteria are stewing. Even at the deepest level, our DNA includes the DNA of other organisms that long ago became incorporated into our systems. Racists talk about blood purity and racial purity, but we are all mongrels, and race itself is an invented concept. There is no biological definition of race. None of us is pure, not even purely human. We are a community of relationships. This is the one place where I probably don't need to introduce Sangam poetry. But as most of you know, some 2,000 years ago, there was a blossoming of literature in southern India that came to be called Sangam, or convergence, confluence. One of the two styles of that literature is Akam, a poetry in which personal emotions, the nuances of love, are linked with landscape in such a way that human feeling is expressed as inseparable from the place where that feeling occurs. The remarkable intellectual N. Manu Chakravarti generously wrote an essay included in my book, Twice Alive, in which he introduces Sangam to an American audience. Other contemporary scholars of Sangam now argue that the boundaries between inner Akam and outer Puram landscapes are far more porous than scholars previously assumed, and that the ultimate goal of Sangam poetry and poetics is the dissolution of any split between self and world landscape. As you are well aware, A.K. Ramunajan translated and reintroduced much of that poetry, which we might consider now a kind of proto-eco-literature, a phenomenological poetics in which human subjectivity merges with the world. Sangam seems to me to be a corpus that has a great deal to contribute to our considerations of the ecological crisis of our own time. And I wanted to call attention to this body of work in America, where it is too little known. Since the five basic landscapes that appear in Sangam Poetics happen to be the same five basic landscapes common to California, where I live, I wrote poems loosely inspired by Sangam Poetics, but located in California. Last paragraph. Finally, I want to say this about the poems I'm about to read. I'm hoping you can be involved with the poetry without feeling an obligation to make immediate sense of it. Part of my strategy as a poet is to draw the reader outside the limits of familiar expression easily agreed upon values or neatly summarized meanings. I want the reader to experience meaning as in life, an active collaboration of world and attentiveness. I'm given to draw on 
pointed streams of language types, scientific, that's my background, descriptive and emotive. It's my belief that poetry doesn't simply supplement the rational intellect, but provides inherently and sometimes incommensurable forms of insight. Because its meanings are neither quantitative nor verifiable, poetry may offer different, subtler, and more complex expressions than the language of information and commerce. So we're going to start with a poetry film that um, is called Twice Alive, Circumambulation of Mount Tamalpais. And it's connected to a collaboration I'm doing with Ashwini Bhatt, in which we follow um, a prescribed route of circumambulation around a holy mountain in California called Mount Tamalpais. Many poets have done this circumambulation, starting with Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg, um, and extending to Ashwini and I most recently. So first film. Circumambulation of Mount Tamalpais. Maculas of light fallen weightless from pores in the canopy. Our senses part of the wheeling life around us. And through an undergrowth stoked with the unseen go the reverberations of our steps. As we hike upward, mist holds the butterscotch taste of Jeffrey Pine to the air until we reach a serpentine barren, red bud, lilac, and open sky, a crust of frost on low-lying clumps of manzanita. At Redwood Creek, two tandem runners cross a wooden bridge over the stream ahead of us, the raspy check-check-check of a scrub jay. Hewing to the dipsia path while a plain's slow groan diminishes bayward, my sweat-wet shirt going cool around my torso as another runner goes by, his cocked arms held too high. Cardiac Hill's granite boulders appear freshly sheared. Look, you say, I can see the Farallon Islands there, to the south, over those long-backed hills. One behind another, a crow honks. The moon still up over Douglas firs on the climb to Rock Spring. Yellow jackets and painted lady butterflies settle on the path where some underground trickle moistens the soil. I predict you'll keep to the shade of the laurels to nibble your three anchovy slices over cheese sandwich while I sprawl on a boulder in full sun sucking a pear. The frass of caterpillars tinkles onto beds of dry leaves under the oaks, where a hawk alights with its retinue of raging crows. We are prey to the ache of not knowing what will be revealed as the world lunges forward to introduce itself. Clusters of tiny green dots, bitter oyster, line the black stick held in your hand. Weak trees leaning into us as if we were part of the wet dark that sustains their roots under dead leaves and at armillaria. Since honey mushrooms suck from the soil chemicals that trigger a tree's defenses, they leach the tree's sap undetected, all the while secreting toxins to stave off competing species. But in the inseparable genetic mosaic of their thin root filaments, the identity of any singular species blurs among interactive populations, twice alive. Near the summit, a gleaming slick inside outcrop sanctifies the path, winding through a precinct of green schists whose lethal minerals sterilize the ground. The hum of some large insect immelmanning around our heads calls to mind, you tell me, the low drone of a Buddhist chant. But now we really hear chanting we can't decode, 
Don't be so rational. A congregate speech from the red trembling sprigs. A vascular language prior to our breathed language, corporeal, chemical, drawing our sound into its harmonic, tuning us to what we've not yet seen, the surround calling us, theoryless, toward an inference of horizontal connections, there at ground level, an incantation, independent of us, but detectable, consummate, always resistant to us, but inciting our recognition of what it might mean to be here, among others, human and not. Here, home, where ours is another of the small voices taking us over, over ourselves, over into the nothing between, the out of sight of ourselves, a litany from spore-bearing mouths as <coughs> hi-fi stretch their long necks and open their throats, opening a link between systems, a supersaturation of syntax, an arousal even as slow Rolling walls of high decibel sonar blow out the ears of whales, and fires burn uncontrolled, and slurry pits leak into the creek, etc., etc., femicides, war, righteous <coughs> insistence, and still, and still, the lived sensation fits into the living sensorium. Can't you hear? Don't be so rational. The world inhale. Hear the call from elsewhere, which is just where we are, no, even closer, inside us, inside the blood pulse of our bodies, the bristle of our mosses, the embrace, and exhale. My, it's, okay. it's always tricky when people clap after like individual poems because then if they don't clap I think oh that was a failure <clears throat> my book twice alive begins with a note to the reader which it would probably be a good idea for me to share with you before I read any further um, because a lot of the poems have to do with lichen what many of us learned in in high school about lichen that it's an indicator species for pollution. Litmus, in fact, is derived from lichen. And that it's the synergistic alliance of a fungus and an algae, or cyanobacteria, is pretty much true, but simplified. Lichen ecology seems to have more to do with collaboration than competition. And collaboration is transformative. And just in case, I'm assuming all of you know what lichen is. You've seen it on rocks and sort of gray-green um, stuff. You can't tell whether it's dead or alive. With lichen, which may be more related to animals, and incidentally, lichen uh, is found on more than 92% of the earth. With lichen, which may be more related to animals than plants, some scientists say, the original organisms, that algae and that cyanobacteria, are changed utterly in their compact. They can never return to what they were before they merge. And according to Anne Pringle, one of the leading contemporary mycologists with whom I had the lucky opportunity to collaborate, it may be that lichen do not, given sufficient nutrients, age. Anne and other contemporary biologists are saying that our sense of the inevitability of death may be determined by our mammalian orientation. Perhaps some forms of life have theoretical immortality. The thought of two things that merge, mutually altering each other, Two things that intermingled and interactive become one thing that does not age brings me to think of the nature of intimacy. Isn't it often in our most intimate relations that we come to realize that our identity, all identity, is combinatory? Forest. Forest is one of the five landscapes that come up in the Sangam poems. So this forest has one R, unlike my name, Forest. Forest. Erogenous zones in oaks, slung with 
stoles of lace lichen, the sun's rays spilling through leaves in broken packets, a force, call it nighttime, thrusts mushrooms up from their lair of spawn, mycelial loam, the whiff of port. They pop into untrammeled air with a sort of gasp that follows a fine chess move, like memories are they, or punctuation. Was it something the earth said to provoke our response, tasking us to recall an evolutionary course, our long ago initiation into the one among others? And within my newborn noticing, have you popped up beside me, love? Or were you here from the start, a swarm of meaning and decay, still gripping the underworld, both of us half buried, holding fast, if briefly, to a swelling vastness, while our coupling begins to register in the already awake compendium that offers to take us in. You take me in, and abundance floods us, floats us out. We fill each with the other, all morning breaks as birdsong over us who rise to the surface so our faces might be sprung. Another of the Sangam landscapes is called Wasteland. It's um, been pointed out to me that in English there happens to be another poem called Wasteland that few people have read. <clears throat> this one is called Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa is the town next to the town that I moved to when I moved to California. That same year that I moved there, the town burned um, because of uh, drought and wildfires uh, stimulated by global warming. Two years later, Santa Rosa burned again. Wasteland for Santa Rosa. Green spring grass on the hills had cured by June, and by July, gone woolly and brown, it crackled underfoot, desiccated, while within the clamor of live oaks, an infestation of tiny larvae clung to the underleaves, feeding between veins. Their frass, that fine dandruff of excrement and boring dust, tinkled as it dropped onto dead leaves below the limbs. You could hear it, twenty feet away, tinkling. Across the valley, on Sugarloaf Ridge, the full moon showed up, like a girl doing cartwheels. No one goes on living the life that isn't there. Below a vast column of smoke, heat, flame, and wind, I rose, swaying and tottering on my erratic vortex, extemporizing my own extreme weather, sucking up acres of scorched topsoil and spinning it outward in a burning sleet of filth and embers that catapulted me forward with my mouth open in every direction at once. So I came for you, churning, turning the present into purgatory, because I need to turn everything to tragedy before I can see it because it must be leavened with remorse for the feeling to rise. And, um, and this poem is called Immigrant Sea. Sea is another of the, the Sangam landscapes. Immigration um, is um, the human, uh, human migration right now is the greatest in all of human history, people crossing what we now call borders, which didn't used to be borders. And uh, I live with an immigrant to the United States, uh, Ashwini Bhatt. So I've been thinking a lot about immigration and also about how waves of any sea are constant immigrants to a shore. Immigrant Sea, aroused by her inaccessibility, he aches for more of her life to live inside him, watching the breakers, standing so close he can feel heat coming off her wet scalp. What is his relation to this person before him, 
so familiar and foreign. The way he searches out her face, he searches out himself. Gusts, thrash crests of swell, spring grasses twirl, circles in the sand where they stand without speaking. She wants him to know. It's all charged, even grass, positive, pollen, negative. So when grass waves, it sweeps the air for pollen. He feels electricity all around, as though the wild drama of the coming storm were already aware of them, foreigners, on this shore. Little sapphire blue flowers speckle the dunes. He wonders if he has let himself flatten out into a depthless sheet, like escalator stairs, whether in the end he'll disappear underground without the smallest lurch of resistance. But when her lavish face turns toward him, beaming, the corners of her eyes wind wet, he yields to that excess, he reappears to himself. Um, now I'll show you uh, another uh, movie that's another collaboration, this time with a photographer, Lucas Folia, and a musician named Brady Earnhardt. And the poem is written from hours and hours of interviews with people in the American South who live in what used to be called utopian communities, and now the preferred word is intentional communities, people that live completely off the grid, some groups of them uh, living, in, um, living together in places where they refuse to kill anything. So they eat um, animals that have been killed by the side of the road, and they eat um, fruit and vegetables that have dropped in the forest, others who live together for religious reasons, others um, because even in America you can't has, have as many guns as these people want to have. So interviewing these people and living among them for a while, Lucas Folia uh, took photographs after he came to know them. And this poem is derived from their words. Um, and I think it speaks a lot about America, the country that I'm from. Moving around for the light, a madrigal. The natural order of things, sugar bushing. Some things we do would gross people out because they just don't know always was baffled by the connections in life. It's moving around for the light. I thought, that plant's growing before my eyes. It's insane, what the news media don't want you to know about. All the wild, edible plants, for instance. Getting on good here, blacks and white. No fossil fuel-based technology. I've eaten owl, wing muscles, and leg muscles. That's the only meat on him. All this roadkill, beavers, otters, deer, raccoon. We cook them up, preserve the hide instead of slashing it. Got it laid out real clear. A lot can be done with duct tape. A bucket of honey between May and August. Who controls oil controls the world. It's a lawyer's racket, but they don't go by law. That's the truth, and people don't even know it. Want to find my bearings and what's real started an anarchist collective with 13 others, like myself, independent people. Mountains seem to draw folks who want to live in wilderness. The biggest problems come from being disconnected. I did really well in school, but I didn't like it. How do you sustain yourself day to day? Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes. A grist mill, a harness shop, most people independent enough to live out here like this. They're too independent to listen to each other. Feed somebody lunch and they cut your wood all year. That works. Until the kids are grown, don't want to bring others in on account of influence. Some things we do would gross people out because they don't know. Where do you think you come by your pattern for your axe handle? 
Take your old axe handle and lay it on there. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. We'll mind ourselves, let us alone. They wear people out so they say, I'll just pay the fine. That's the truth, and people don't even know it. I was on her windshield, 20 or 30 feet, and then she hit the brakes, and I flew into a telephone pole. Heard a lot of stories about people's lives, who needs a house, and how much tin. We're different, you can't treat us the same. Garlic, pumpkin, onion, squirrel, and people come to learn to make sorghum. Those that have enough guts to live off the land, they are independent people like myself, but I lived in community, lived with the Amish. With them, woodcutting isn't cutting wood. Wood's a byproduct. That's why you can't use chainsaws. You can't talk to someone over a chainsaw. Want to move in a way that's more connected. See the cause and effect in my life. Right at the start of my senior year, a natural progression from activism and travel. How do you sustain yourself day to day? And people come to learn to make sorghum. What the news media don't want you to know. Those dogs, they're rabbit dogs. Like to lose that feeling of being a foreigner, find a sense of being at home. Out felling trees alone on a windy day, took my eyes off it for three seconds. A big gust of wind came up and blew it down on me. My first thought was, oh shit, I don't have insurance, which is a funny thought, considering. Let's get this process right. I'm not quitting unless I feel in my heart I'm going to quit. That's the difference between me and other people. Blue heron is good, tastes good. Ever eat a blue heron? Supervisor said there's no common law in Virginia. We don't know how fast it's going to happen. Food's going to be number one. Next is going to be ammo. We figure we'll end up feeding a lot of people. Took my eye off it for three seconds. First thought was, oh shit. It's a right. It's always been a right. The difference between me and other people. We'll care for ourselves, let us alone. I've got it laid out real clear. Biggest problems come from being disconnected. Beavers, otters, deer, raccoon. I've eaten owl. Hard to feed yourself for a year. Milk goats are the most valuable thing you can have. Banks go down, people can't get money. They're going to see what they need. Food's number one, and next is going to be ammo. If bad goes to worse, we'll post a man to keep out strangers. Working to get that other doctor to move here. Like in Vietnam, killing those women and kids. That's not the American mindset. But I think it might come to such. Tanning hides, fire without matches. When others won't, we'll make it. Take five milk goats and a sack of sweet potatoes. You can go anywhere. The natural order of things is where the species gets dominant over its niche. I'm always baffled by the connections. That plant's growing before my eyes. It's insane. Instantly felt comfortable here. Skinned my first raccoon and it looked so much like a fetus, I cried. Don't know how fast it's going to happen or if it'll happen, but if it doesn't happen, we're not hurting either way. Grew up using a bow and arrow to shoot rabbits. Need to be around like-minded people so I can see the cause and effect in my life. They're really strong personalities. I have a strong personality too. Nobody comes in, nobody leaves. Ever eat a blue heron? Natural order of things. Wing muscles and leg muscles, that's the only meat on him. Where do you think you come by your pattern? Let's get this process right. Want to find my bearings and what's real. Move in a way that's more connected.
Okay, there's just, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks to my collaborators there. There's just one more poem that I'd like to read, and it's also a poetry film. If you can stand one more, um, this one is called Unto Ourselves, and it's also from Twice Alive. Unto Ourselves. To see what's there and not already patterned by familiarity, for an unpredicted whole is there, casting a pair of shadows, manipulating its material, advancing, assembling enough kinship that we call it life, our life, what is already many lives, the dimensions of its magnitude veiled to us as we live it. Across the cytoplasm of adjacent cells goes a signal that turns you toward me, turns me into you. We are coupled in quiet tumult, convergent arguments, an alien rhythm becoming familiar, a rhythm of I am here, never to be peeled away. We are become one thing, listening for what's there and not. Through the storm, neem trees on the hill stamp wildly in their roots. We have passed through the spring, but what thing has passed through us? Now your laughter transparentizes me, and whose sense of the self doesn't swerve? Your unconditional foreignness grows conditional, stops being foreign at all. With your nearness, my lens on the world shifts. A peristaltic contraction courses through us as a single wave. No longer can we keep our distance, our lips brush, or the tips of ourselves. But what language are you whispering to me, your teeth stained by Nilgiri tea, above the trills and whistles in the high limbs, above the screech of a bulldozer blade, shoving rubble up the wounded street, above the silence of an eyeless tick climbing a grass stem? I understand nothing but the lust your voice incites, the declamatory tenderness. How? And who can say what force has queued up this hour for our small voices to merge into a carnality that did not exist before now? Come to this unforeseen conjunction. We slip into one another. We take hold in a pulse of heat, in a yes and no, for already we can see we are no longer what we were. As I find you within me, not fused, not bonded, but lodged. And for you, is it the same? The intensity of such investment, each of us excited by the volatility of the other, which propels us in a rush as something, perhaps our lips brush or the tips of ourselves, stripping away what? What was before? Was there even anything before? The reconfiguration is instantaneous experience. It is being itself. But who's being now? Was I endowed with some special pliability so that becoming part of you, I didn't pass through my own nihilation? And what does the death of who you were mean to me, except that now you are present constantly? Because excess is what it took for us to transform, to a fold. You cast your life beyond itself. Can't you sense me with your ecstatic openness, like rain mingling with red earth? Without you I survived, and with you I live again in a radical augmentation of identity, because we have effaced our outer limits, because we summoned each other. In you, I cast my life beyond itself. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so, um, I'd be very happy to hear um, comments or questions. Um, I'm also very interested in translation, um, and maybe some of you are also. <clears throat> So 
So one, one question I have, and it's a real question, um, would be, um, because I use a lot of scientific language and sometimes philosophical language in, in my poems, um, and I don't expect people to know all of the words, but I think words sometimes have a texture and sound and rhythm that also makes meaning. Um, so that doesn't bother me. But I wonder, honestly, if um, if you f find it difficult or you're you're okay with that. <clears throat> um, no, I, I, I don't think it bothers me. I think, um, as you said, the rhythm of language and uh, there's a musicality that speaks to you differently, uh, even when you don't. So it's almost like I, I find that I listen on two levels. One is the sound of, of what is being said um, speaks to me. And also then almost two beats behind, I think, the comprehension of the words. That's so great. So, yeah. That, that excites me. Actually, linguists say that, um, that that happens, that in fact, in almost every language, um, there are patterns that create meaning before we have semantic meaning, that in almost every language, a rhythm like means no. In almost every language, women will talk to babies with an uplifting tilt to their voice. In almost every language, the, um, the O's and O sounds are connected to deeper emotional registers than the, the E and, and, and uh, it sounds. In fact, um, if, uh, unless some of you speak Japanese, I could recite a Japanese poem which no one here will understand semantically, but I think you'll have a feeling that it gives because simply of the sound. So this is a, uh, um, this is, you'll, you'll see the rhythm is five, seven, five, seven, seven, um, a hoku. And uh, so here it goes. Kure yakono yuku mo kaeru mo wakarete wa shiru mo shiranu mo osaka no seki. So what's the vowel sounds that you hear mostly? The what? Those O's, those long O's. Um, which give us a, a, a feeling, those register inside our bodies. And in fact, this poem um, by Semimaru from the old anthology of, of Japanese poets called the Maniyoshu um, is about people parting, about uh, a, a gate in the town of Osaka um, where uh, men would leave on their journeys and the women and children would wave goodbye. It's a poem of longing and those long uh, o and U sounds um, are full of that longing. And I think we register that even without knowing um, consciously what the semantic meaning of the poem is. A cool thing about the poem also, why it's uh, really highly regarded in Japanese, is because um, that, last, uh, that last line, uh, so, so, shiru no shiranu mo, seven, and then we're, we're going to get to the five, osaka no sek, or to, to the last seven, 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 osaka no seki. It's short one syllable, but in old Japanese, the town of Osaka was pronounced with a double O. So it really even brings that dark O out even stronger. Osaka no seki. Other, other questions or comments? Yeah. No. Just thank you very much for your poetry. It was very beautiful. And uh, what really touched me was, you know, taking something from lichen, like a microorganism, and then connecting to our feelings, and then so many gross things as well. So there's this constant kind of sliding between something so deep in the ground and something within us and the universe. It's very beautiful. Uh, and I do have a question. Um, uh, this, uh, when we think of, you know, when we have some kind of very beautiful experience with nature, 
and there's a poem kind of, you know, bubbling in the thoughts. Um, and then we want to put it down on paper, you know, as beginners. Um, so how should we do it? Like, should it just come unfiltered on the page first? And then how to make it beautiful? Uh, so. Well, that's the secret to art, right? <laughs> it's a big question. But I think for most of us, if we, if we put a filter on in the beginning, we begin to cut ourselves off. And so it's really important to let yourself fail and write something that you're not going to be happy with later, but to get that material down and then to begin to go back over it and to revise and revise, finding the thing, the thing sort of taking shape as you're dealing with it. Robert Creeley, a poet who I love very much, um, said, I see as I write. So it's not like you have an idea that's completely full and then you just write it. But actually in the writing itself, in the process, that writing stimulates other ideas, which are partly musical, partly sound-based. Mm -hmm. So I think letting yourself go at it, having a, a glass of wine and a glass of coffee right after it would, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was really moving in many different ways. Thank you. Uh, I have three questions, actually. So my first question is, how did you first become acquainted with Sangam poetry? How did you discover it? Uh, my second question is, you'd mentioned collaboration can be transformative. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that, how collaboration is transformative? And my third question is, um, inspired by the last question, what is beautiful? Uh, <laughs> so I, I struggle with this myself, understanding what is actually beauty. So I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, the first question, how did I come across Sangam? Um, I s started dating a woman named Ashwini Bhatt, who um, is sitting there, uh, who grew up in, um, in Putur and lived in, here in, in Bangalore. Um, and, uh, and she turned me on to Sangam. And it seemed so remarkable to me that 2,000 years ago, people were like, what happened to that consciousness that our feelings are automatically connected to the things around us um, that has led us to abuse nature, to use it just as transactional material. And we find ourselves in um, the biggest uh, human ecological crisis uh, in, in all of history. So um, that knowledge base um, really inspired me, and I saw a lot of connections between it and, um, and our situation. Uh, you know, the, the idea that, <clears throat> that Descartes has, you know, when he says, je, je pense dans je suis, I think, therefore I am, um, is refuted by Sangam Poetics because you don't think in, in nowhere. You think, and your thinking is already engaged with a place that you're in. And, um, and so the Sangam poets were also philosophical poets. I found it very inspiring. The second question was collaboration. So inspired by working with Lycan and this mycologist and seeing that things that can come together can produce something different than either of those things could have done on their own. Um, and thinking that intimacy, our relationships with other humans that we're closest to, transform us, that we're changed in that. Um, and also my experience as a translator and as a collaborator with other artists, I find that collaboration models a kind of social behavior that I admire, that I want to live out, where it's not egocentric, where you give up something, and in giving up something, you're allowed to arrive at, at something else that you wouldn't have gotten to on your own, and that that can be very important, both ethically and artistically. And the last, sorry, last question. Beautiful. That's the hardest question. Yeah. The, I think beauty 
beauty changes and it's always in the receiver's um, uh, uh, feeling base that Basho, who, where, there you are, um, would you tell me your name again? Uh, Manush. Yeah. Manush. Um, Manush is very interested in haiku and Basho, Re Basho revolutionized haiku because at the time he was writing, people were writing all these pretty images, you know, the willow, willow tree in rain, um, da 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 da. And he said, no, that's, you know, that's hackneyed. What's beautiful is a crow plucking a snail from the mud. Um, and uh, the French surrealist uh, artist, um, uh, Breton, Andre Breton, says, beauty will be convulsive or it will not be at all. I think that shares a little bit with Basho's idea. But I think it's always um, the viewer who determines what's beautiful or the receiver, not like what, what I think of as beautiful may not strike you the same way. <laughs> um, wow, that's really complicated. Um, I, 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 I agree with Basho and with Andre Breton. I want something f for beauty. I want it to have a strangeness and I want it to expand what I came to look at it with. There's an artist named um, Ed Rusha in the United States who says um, good art, or he says bad art, when you look at bad art, you go, wow, huh? And when you look at good art, you go, huh? Wow! And it's that huh moment where you, you're not prepared for what you're looking at. You're in an unknown space. And, um, and it offers something to you that you weren't expecting. I think, I think deep beauty has to do that. What do you think? It's being touched. And that gets back to collaboration and intimacy. And I'm right with you there. Um, thanks so much, Forrest. It's been an absolutely lovely evening. It's uh, the compilations that you've put together is you know, it's more than just poetry. The films that you're making, and it's it's been great hearing it, being in person. Um, I have a comment and I have a question. The comment was in response to your question about using scientific words, um, but focusing on the texture of the words and the rhythm they make. Uh, if anything, for me personally, the scientific words because they have. They're monosyllabic, uh, multisyllabic words or polysyllabic words. There's a lot yeah. of syllables going on. Um, they give you the opportunity to actually create more texture than you know other kinds of language. So that, uh, as a feedback, if you were looking for that question, I am. absolutely. You know, scientific words really help because uh, cyanobacteria. How many syllables do you have in there? Yeah. And it's great, and you can rhyme it with things. And um, so more and more of that, absolutely. Thank you for letting me know, just yeah. as a response, yeah. And I mean, it, it, it speaks to a certain detailing of an image. Uh, you know, folks hear scientific words, and even if they don't get exactly how a scientist perceives them, you do have an image that gets formed. There is a lot more detail than the generic beauty, you know, generic ways of describing beauty. Um, so that's my comment. My question, something I noticed in your poetry, and, you know, you kind of covered multiple genres there. You had um, in, in the eco-poetry, in the, in the first bit where you were doing the circumambulation around the uh, mountain in California, uh, where there's a certain rhythm that was nature-oriented, regenerative-oriented, there was, to me, there was, again, I, I think uh, uh, someone also commented there was a flowing to it. Uh, there, there was a certain, uh, you know, almost like the lichen, the slippage of lichen was going on in, in the poetry. Uh, and while in the second one with the um, intentional communities, uh, you use their words, but the way it was put together, uh, of course, there's a libertarian sense to it. There's a, a hyper-personality, aggressive sense to it. And the pauses in that poetry were also kind of helping with that. Would you, I mean, is there a way you can speak about that? I mean, what the subject of the poetry, is there a rhythm that you tried to capture? that was different in those different genres because it came across very differently. Thank you for noticing that. I, I, I think um, a new rhythm is like a new idea and that every poem um, 
has to find the rhythm that's characteristic of the emotion and intelligence of that poem, and that that has to change. And um, and what one of the things a poet uses uh, for that uh, with rhythm is silence, the silence around it, the space between, um, and that uh, that pause can create almost an erotic tension between what came before and what's about to come next but it also is a kind of palate cleanser and gives the uh, the listener uh, a, a moment to register what's happened before and prepare for what happens next but different poems require different amounts of silence and I, I'm really touched that you found the flow in the in the nature poems um, particular, in those poems, I don't use any punctuation at all because really in life, there isn't any punctuation, right? Everything goes on. Um, Janis Joplin in, in uh, the live version of Ball and Chain sings, it's always the same day, man, because there isn't any real determination between where something um, become something else. It's just, it's transition and segue. Um, so, and it's, and I think of poetry as a very embodied art. Um, and so I'm also listening to my body process the words and the experience and trying to um, feel that rhythm in my body. They say, um, scientists say that when you read, even when you read silently to yourself, that your Adam's apple is moving, that your body is registering rhythms, even when you think that you're not. Great, thank you so much. I'd just like to uh, read out a very short passage from Raina Maria Rilke and then fantastic. ask you a question about that. And yet it is not enough to have memories. You must be able to forget them when they are many. And you must have the immense patience to wait until they return. For the memories themselves are not important. Only when they have changed into our very blood, into glance and gesture, and are nameless, no longer to be distinguished from ourselves, only then can it happen that in some very rare hour, the first word of a poem arises in their midst and goes forth from them. Beautiful, so, yeah. So to me, this is a lot about the relationship with nature where you, where you don't hold on to your memories, to, to yourself, and you just let them free and then you forget them and they go and seed themselves within the landscape. And when they return to you with, along with some memories that nature has been holding for eons. And... Uh, so I was wondering if you see your relationship with poetry in the same way, where you let your memories lose and allow them to return eventually. And, and if you do, perhaps that's not something that can be boiled down to a method, but there are some regular practices that you follow that, you, that cultivate this embeddedness, this richness. So, so my question is what those practices might be. Uh -huh. First, I, I love the Rilke and that um, I mean, when when Rilke writes also, "Du musst dein Leben ändern," uh, you must change your life. He's talking about this same thing that um, it's not enough to live in your head, um, but you have to embody your experience. Um, that your your memories become part of your body tissue, part of the the language of your body. Um, and the landscape, they're bouncing off the landscape and coming into you. It's again that, that feeling of poetry as, or any art as embodied, um, that our first knowledge is through our bodies. And for me, it's, and I think, I think this is also uh, something that's happening with lots of young people now because we live in a, um, a culture that's full of so much spectacle um, things, images are coming at us constantly. The advertisements, the 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 the, uh, the quick visuals, quick cut visuals on uh, on our computers, um, the con the constant noise um, that 
it can be very easy to stop listening, to forget about attentiveness and to forget about silence. Um, and so for me, the practice is getting out of my head um, with an attentive listening to the world. And I think that's also what happens in translation, that a bad translator is full of the translator's own uh, language and own ideas, and that a good translator has to sublimate the self, has to turn into a giant ear, a listening, a listening so intense that you can hear the music of someone else's mind. And then you can bring that and try to render that into the language that you have. But I think the act of listening, uh, the act that notable American presidents uh, never have practiced, uh, Trump in particular, <clears throat> um, is, uh, is, is the art that all of us can attend. And we, we do that in many different ways, through meditation, um, through conscious meditation, or through our own invented practices. Yes. Um, thanks, Forrest. These wonderful poems. I uh, just, just love them. Um, just a thought, and the, the jury is still out for me in terms of <clears throat> the new medium of of a moving, of a motion film, uh, along with just a box with the poetry, right? Because when I'm reading poetry, I'm trying to imagine the situation. I'm just trying to imagine the poetry. But here I have a medium that's kind of being forced on me. Yeah. So, what is your view about this this new mixture of of moving of motion, uh, film, and poetry together. Do you think it's it's a new medium that poets are going? Because for me, it's it's like okay, I'm reading something that's in my head. I'm kind of you know, it's, it's my own own interpretation, like art, right? I don't like uh, it's like an artist painting, and then the art, artist explaining what the painting is all about. What's what's it like? Yeah, for me, I'm still really attracted to the miracle, especially in in our age of so much spectacle and so much around us. It seems incredible to me that we can sit alone in a room with a book with no sounds and have a transformative experience, which is my experience with good poetry. And I think that's what's happening. I was going to say in the United States, they've done polls recently, and the um, the increase in the audience for poetry in the United States in the last 20, 23 years has been logarithmic. It's a huge increase in the number of people reading poetry. And I think it has, to, and, and particularly among young people and people of color. And I think it has a lot to do with feeling inundated, feeling that things are coming at you all the time, feeling satisfied or entertained at a very light level and feeling like there's got to be something deeper than that, something that drags its anchor through the mud of your soul, of your feeling. And um, so I really, uh, I love just poetry on the page. The poetry in the film is something different. It's a different art. And it may detract in some ways from poetry, or it may bring different aspects out of it. I'm still experimenting with it. Well, that seems good. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm really grateful to be here, and really thankful that you all came. Thank you. <clears throat>